Ahí se me hizo. Se me olvidó. El otro día andaba buscando algo y dije, ¡Ah! Oh, Miren ustedes. Acá, acá.
Good afternoon, everybody, and happy Friday. Welcome to the latest installment of our series of um, instructional webinars on the CSD care system. Today we're focusing on education, which is a mix. There is a bunch of new material here, and also I have some new um, or some information that we've covered before, but I believe to some extent we have a different audience today. So we're just going to go through those things at the end. Um, you know, so once again, I was expecting a few more people to come, but we are recording this presentation. So this will be made available to everybody uh, next week sometime. And I will send out uh, slides from this presentation so everybody will have an opportunity to see those as well. Um, a lot of the material that we're going to cover is based on information that is in the knowledge base. That's the website that's replaced what we used to call the digital hub. Um, so I will direct you there. I'll show you a couple of things from there and I'll share the link with you as well. So further exploration at the knowledge base will probably reveal some helpful insights to everybody. Okay. So I'm going to get started. I'm going to start, as I always do, just with the expectations um, for the current year. Everyone should be in CSD CARES at this point. If you don't have the right access, you can follow the road to access uh, that you were given back in August to get people in. I will cover that a little bit later, in fact. So I've included pieces of that document in this presentation. So the QR codes will be part of the slides when they're sent out. So that will help you navigate to the right place to get access or better access. Um, again, we're setting that out because that is not me or my team. I can't help you get logged in or change your permissions. All I can do is forward that along to the people that are in charge. So I'm just sending you the direct links. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we move forward. I wanted to keep all of these webinars uh, fairly brief. Uh, kind of bite-sized chunks for people to digest and possibly refer back to. Um, once again, though, this is pretty long, and I wasn't able to really boil it down too much shorter. So what I'm going to ask is for everyone to once again keep your microphones muted throughout the presentation. If you have questions, we'll put them in the chat. We are going to save the chat at the end of the session so if i don't get to answer everyone's questions during the presentation we'll still have access to that and we will get back to you some some things we may not have the answer to right now but we'll find out and get back to you okay um again with the expectations for the current year all the children should be enrolled now with funding in a class or a group um, new children can only be added through school mints. Children that you add directly uh, can't be included, enrolled in particularly PFA and PI programs because you need to use the CPS system to, um, to enroll children in the CPS pro funded programs. Okay, we need attendance to be taken. We need required documentation to be submitted. And as we roll things out, we expect everybody to attend training, which you're doing right now. Thank you. Remove the materials in the knowledge base. Um, it, make an attempt to implement everything and ask for help if it's not working, rather than giving up. Okay, so let's look at education. We're going to be doing a few things today. I'm going to look, first of all, at teaching staff, how to add them how to add their employment record and their credentials. We're also going to add them to a class. Um, we're going to look at a couple specific things about how 
um, teacher files are related to the rest of the system. And we are going to look at developmental screening and disabilities. I left off this list, but we're also going to look at what we call interactions. Interactions are things like home visits and parent teacher conferences and other circumstances that where there's contact with families and children that needs to be documented. So there's a way to do that. Um, pretty much all the different types of interactions are going to follow the same method to put them in. So once you've seen one, you kind of get an idea about how everything works. OK, so the first section we're going to look at how to add a teacher. So I'm going to be clear about this. What I'm going to cover now is putting teaching staff into the system who will not have access to CSD cares. We still need to know who they are, what class they're in and so on. Um, but if this is how you put somebody in, if you don't want them to be able to log in. If you do want your teachers to be able to log in and do some things in CSD cares, for example, take attendance. Um, I recommend that actually. I recommend that teachers be users rather than staff who don't have access. Um, so in the case where you want to add teachers and you want them to be able to access the system, then you will actually just put them in through the DFSS new user form, um, which is that survey monkey form. I included the link here, but we've also got a QR code if you want to do it with your phone. So this is where we go back to that road to access. Okay. So to add a new user who has never been in the system before, including again, teachers, assistant teachers, if you want them to access and do any documentation in the system, um, you can scan this QR code. It will take you to the form and you will put them in as a new user. Then we will add them at that point. They will appear in the system just like a contact that you created. But the difference is they will also have access to um, CSD cares. OK. In addition, <clears throat> we have existing users who can't log in. Um, so they've been giving um, username and password, but for whatever reason, they're still not able to access the system. This is a different code. Scan this and complete the form again to get assistance with that. And the third thing, if you can get in, but you don't have access to do the tasks that you've been assigned to do, uh, in that case, you'll submit a ticket through the ServiceNow system. Um, that's part you log in at the same place. You would log in to get into CSD Cares at chicagodfss.org, and then you would go to ServiceNow and start a ticket. I believe the link to start a ticket says get help. OK, but in the case where you're adding a teacher and that person is not going to be a CSD Cares user, you can just add them as a contact directly. So you go to the top of your home screen. You see the little house in the upper left hand corner when you're in CSD Cares. That little house means take me home. So from the home screen, actually from many screens, you can see this top banner. You would select new contact. So you, you select contacts. We'll give you a list of everybody that's in there already. You're going to ignore that and go over to the button that says new and hit new. But then you have many different types of contacts you can add. Again, don't add children or pregnant women from here. Um, unless they are children who are CCAP only and who are never going to receive any Head Start, Preschool for All, PI funding, anything like that. Um, and then CCAP only kids you can add here, I think. But for uh, children funded through Chicago Early Learning Programs, they need to come in through School Mint. But for site agency staff, you can add them right here. Just new contact 
click that radio button that says site agency staff and hit next. So we want this form filled out as completely as possible. Um, the items marked with the red asterisk are required, but those actually aren't the only fields that we want. By required, that means if you don't include them, then you won't be able to save the file. You will say required items are missing. You'll get an error message, but that's not actually everything that is needed. So we have, uh, you know, basic information, first name, last name. Um, where it says account name, this is the name of the site where they are being employed. So if you want to still have access to the file after you create it, they have to be associated with a site that you have access to. So you would go to the account name field here and just start typing in the name of your center until it comes up. Um, and then pick that from the menu that has appeared here. So then there is a bunch of information here that doesn't have a red asterisk next to it because you don't need to fill it out immediately in order to save the record. But we really do need it. So for teaching staff, they should have a gateways ID that connects to their, their gateways credential and the professional development they've done there. And they should have an IEIN, which is the Illinois Educators Identification Number. And we need that for lead teachers for preschool for all or PI. If you have submitted that information on a spreadsheet, but you didn't have the IEIN, we haven't been able to send it to CPS and they still don't count as enrolled. So we need that for all of your teachers. The easiest way to get that to us is to add it right here in CSD Cares, and then we can look it up and attach it to everybody before we send it on. Um, it also has a preferred phone type. So I ask which is preferred and it has like home phone, cell phone, work phone. Just for the record, we prefer work phone because we want your phone number so we can call you at work. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we need you to fin finish the rest of it, the demographic information. Um, this goes on some, again, reporting for ISBE. So we do need it to be complete. Okay. <clears throat> so once you've done that, you click save and you have a contact file for your teacher. Okay, the next thing we need to know about them though is credentials. Do they have the credentials that are required for teachers under their funding source? Uh, so like everything else in CSD Cares, credentials are going to be found on what's called the related list. So I'll keep referring to this throughout the day. I've been throughout all the other presentations. So the related list are these boxes that are found on the right side of the contact and account screens. Um, there are a lot of them. So most things, if you're looking for a place, where do I enter this? Where do I enter that? It's in a related list and just scroll down and down and down until you get to the bottom. Some of the important stuff is really close to the bottom for some reason. So when you first look at the page, you don't see anything. So scroll all the way down. So when you find the related list that's labeled credentials, um, select new. You can see here that there are several different types that you can add. Once again, you're going to need to add all of them that apply to the teacher that you're entering. So you have a certification, a degree, that's obvious what that is, your gateways, credentials, that would be like gateways level four. Um, you know, license, the big one that comes up here is the PEL. Um, so any of those things that are applicable, you would put them in again from this credentials tab. They'll all be separate lines in the box that will form at, as part of the credentials related list. So this example, again, the, the, 
there are different lines, different specific fields for the different types of credentials, um, but the process is the same. So I'm just showing you an example here for a degree. Um, so you put, you would give it a name so you would know what it means when you find it on the related list. Uh, and you have the teacher. You see, you're not entering the teacher's name. It's by default connected to the file that you were on. So you're doing this from the related list on the teacher's contact page. So it will automatically have the, the teacher's name and link right there. Um, so you'd want the what the degree was in, what level it was, whether it was completed, if completed one. Uh, if you're going to put in several, so if they have a Gateways credential and a Pell and a bachelor's degree, then you would get save and new and to put them in one right after another um, without having to go find the credentials box again. Just do it all at one time. And as I mentioned before, their Pell is located under license, it's an option on the drop down menu in that form. Right now, you're looking at the degree. Okay, so then we need to add their employment. Except, as I found out when I was putting this presentation together, this is a trick question. So, how do you add employment? The answer is at first, you can't. So first you need to have a position. So when you have an employment, it means they've been hired for a job and the job has to exist in the system before you can hire somebody for it, which kind of makes sense. So on the site account page, and when I say the account page, I mean, you know, Fun Bunnies 2 or whatever the name of the site is, as opposed to the agency page. Um, you click down to positions, which is one of these related boxes, and select new. So as with all of these items that we're going over right now, um, the fields that are required are going to be marked with that red asterisk. Uh, but those aren't really only the, the fields that we need. We will have other things that we would like to have included. But for the, um, for the position here, I'll just call it the lead teacher for the ivory class, which I just made up. The account, again, is the site at which the class and thus the position are at. It just says vacant automatically until you fill it with someone. So leave that alone. And then it's got the number of weeks per year and the number of hours worked. <laughs> okay, so once you've added the position and saved it, then you can go to uh, to the contact page for your new teacher and go to employments. And, and I should add here that when you have a teacher leave and another teacher then comes, you're hiring the replacement to fill that same position. So you don't have to do that part again. Once the position exists, like classroom one teacher, you, you don't have to do that the next time you hire a teacher for classroom one. Once you've terminated the one teacher, you'll just put the other one in the same position that you created before. Um, that's actually essential because that's how we're going to track turnover. So we really don't want a new position created every time there's a new hire. We want to see who's had the same job. OK, so you go to down the related list on the teacher's page to employments and you'll check new. OK, so you add an appointment and you're going to give that a name again, just so you'll recognize it. So here I have the teacher's name and what position it is there. But then the position you're not going to type in. You, you can start typing until you find it. But this is the position that I just created in the last screens. So we, if you create like classroom one teacher and then you hire that person, you will put them in that position on this form. And in the title, which there's too many of these, but find the one that's most appropriate. Um, 
Again, you're going to put the agency and site here. Um, often those are two different files that have the same name. So if you're a partner site, you probably won't be able to put the funding agency in. It would have to be the, the actual organizations. So it's probably similar to the site name. Okay, and the employee type, I didn't show you the menu here, but it's like permanent substitute, you know, contract. It, those are the options. And then obviously, uh, the teacher will have automatically populated, but that's the, again, that object there on your staff is the teacher that we created. Now, these other things, again, you're going to have a credential. Um, uh, in the class relation, but we haven't put the teacher in a class yet. We did just go over the credential, uh, but I didn't save it when I made these slides. So you can also fill these areas in eventually. Um, just right now, I'm doing it in this order. I didn't have anything to put in these uh, in these blanks, but there are also going to be objects. And we'll get to the class relation specifically in a minute. So. Also on this form, for Head Start teachers, there is something called the Head Start Hire Date. Okay, uh, when I say Head Start, the um, the performance standards have been changed, and they're just calling everything Head Start, and they're kind of getting away from the term Early Head Start. But it, this is everybody funded under a federal grant, uh, birth to five. Uh, so. The reason there's a separate hire date here is to make clear that for Head Start, your hire date has to be after the background check date. You can't get a criminal record check two weeks, a month after they hired. They can't be in the classroom with federally funded children if they don't have a background check. So <laughs> what do you do if they've been working there for years? And, you know, they didn't get a background check before they started working. And the answer is, if you're hired before you received Head Start funding, then the Head Start start date is not before the state of that contract. So you can have somebody that's been there for 20 years, but if you first received funding in the fall of uh, 2019 through the last RFP, then your head start heart date for start date for everybody is 2019. So you receive the contract December 1, 2019. That's ever it's that date or later for everybody. And you shouldn't have had anybody on there that didn't have a head, uh, background check when you started. So therefore their background check date is earlier. Like their their service before receiving head start funding doesn't count. Right, but you that's why there's a separate date because they may have worked at your center from since like 2003. But if you got funded in 2019, then the start date is 2019. Okay. <laughs> so you also need to update the employment record anytime a teacher leaves. Otherwise, it shows them as still employed. So you would go in, this is the resignation form. There's a termination form, it's similar. But when someone resigns, this is what you do. You go in and you put um the date they received the notice the end date for their employment uh there's a question did we want to know if they went to work for cps that's what the move to state pre-k or other means um and then for the resignated the resignation reason you need to put something down from the menu if you can use one of those items at best if you have to use other Please don't say other and leave it blank. Type a reason in the other resignation reason provided field. Because <laughs> we do have to summarize this on our annual report uh, to our funders. Okay. So now this is a advanced part. I debated on whether to include this 
I don't think people are going to pick it up right away. And that's okay, because it's not essential to go forward with the rest of education stuff right now. It's just super convenient for us if it makes sense. Because um, it makes our some of the pages in CSD Care is more readable for us. Um, so on the site account page, it's near the top. So when you scroll down and start looking at the related lists, if not the first, one of the first boxes on that page, it says related contacts. And that's going to be all of the staff people who are associated with that agency or site. Um, so when you see that list, just go down to the corner and click view all. And it'll then show you the longer list. It won't be limited to six people anymore. It'll show you the, all of the staff people. And there will be a little triangle in the far right of every line on the screen. So you will go there and hit edit relationship. And this isn't necessarily for everybody, but it's for people in key role. So for our new teacher here, what we're going to do is edit that relationship. And it's got this box. It's got possible users. You've got preschool teacher, preschool teacher assistant, part three. It's also got, you know, site director, um, education coordinators, and I think some other some other similar fields. So if if any of those are the jobs that they have, just go ahead and move that roll over from the available into the chosen box by clicking on them and then hit saves. This just lets us look at that list and see who are the teachers who basically who, who do we need to call to get information about. Um, we're working on having a better report that will do that. But since right now on that list, the position that you added to employment doesn't show up. If you add the account relation like this, we can see it. So it's super convenient for me personally. So I did include it. <laughs> OK, so once you've got the teacher in and you've got the position, you've got their credentials, um, you need to add them to the appropriate class or caseload. So. And I've seen this uh, a few times recently, so I want to reiterate this with everybody in in our old system in COPA. For home visiting, we basically created a class just like a center based class and enrolled the children in the class. But we didn't take attendance, of course, because that's not how that works. So everybody was absent all the time. So we don't do that anymore. There should not be home visiting classes in CFD Cares. Instead, you're going to create caseloads for your home visitors, which I'll go over in just a second. And the children should be then assigned to those caseloads. And when a home visitor then logs in, and looks at their caseload, they can see all their kids. So part of what that means is that you really shouldn't be adding home visitors as center created contacts. You should go to that road to access. They will need access to CSD cares in order to have a caseload and document visits. Um, so that's how we'll do that piece and then children's center based programs will be enrolled in a class as will their teachers. <laughs> so to go through adding home visiting children to the caseload, you have to have the contact in first. That's what we went uh, over just a minute ago. And then on their site page, you can find them under related contacts, which we also just went over, but I'm just viewing. Um, now, if they're not in there, here I've said go to the digital hub, but don't. If, you're, if your home visitor is not in there, you really need someone to have access to CSD Cares for reasons that I'm about to show you. So you would go to that SurveyMonkey add user form and add them. And so when they are able to log in, they can create a caseload to which you can add children, right? So a new caseload has to be added every program year. Um, this is because 
the way that CSD Cares works. During the summer, we're actually operating two program years simultaneously. Um, <laughs> so we do make it possible to enroll children for the upcoming year before it starts to make the rollover process easier. It, for some people were able to do that this year, others were not, but keep that in mind for next year. Okay, um, so to create a, a caseload, you would select the home visitor's name from the context, and, and then within their file, you can scroll down until you find the caseloads related list and hit new. So this form then, it asks you for a name, but it will ignore whatever you write in that box, which I actually really like. <laughs> uh, so you wanna put the correct funding program version, which is gonna be PI, Early Head Start, or Early Head Start Expansion Home-Based. Um, you've got the, the home visitor you put there under caseworker. And then the time period would either be for the current year or if you're setting up the next year's programs for the next year. Once next year comes online, you'll be able to add stuff to it. See, and when you save, it will ignore the name you put in there, which is why when I demonstrate it, I always just call it Bob or Frank, because it will not name that. It will name it um teacher name dash funding program version dash time period so here it says jane doe early head start home base 2024 to 2025 academic care i like this feature a lot because it makes it possible to um just look at the list and tell what it is so many things in salesforce just have a like an alphanumeric line like PA dash one, two, three, four, five. And so I really like it that it is naming it appropriately. I know the system can do this though, so I wish that it did this in my cases. So once you have a case load, you can assign children to it. There are actually a couple ways to do this. Um, a child has to have a funding program enrollment in the same funding program as the case load. So if you've enrolled the child from sales from school, man, and you've got them in the Salesforce, but you have not added funding, you can't add them to a caseload and you can't write up home visits because the funding program enrollment is required and getting them in the system is not enough and you're not done enrolling at that point. Um, so once they are within the funding source, you can either add them to the caseload from within the caseload, or you can go to the child's funding program enrollment and just add the caseload to them there. In either case, um, you'll pick the current program year and not the previous program year. If you've got the same home visitor for several years, they will all come up here. Again, any, any of these blanks, you start typing and a drop down menu will appear. Once they're enrolled, uh, both on the child file under interactions and on the caseload under interactions, their home visits will show up. And I'll cover that a little bit more in a minute. So stay tuned here. So we're going to go over interactions in a little more detail. Um, but the point right now is that based on their enrollment date and the funding source, it's just the system decides when visits should occur and it automatically creates them. And you can edit them when they, they actually occur and put in the real information. Okay, but, but they have to be funded once again because a caseload is funding specific. And that's because the number of visits required for Head Start home visiting is different from PI home visiting. So they can't mix. So you have to be in a group with the correct funding. Okay. Now for center-based children, similar to the caseload, you need to create a new class for a new program year. 
every year a new one is created and again that's because you can create one in july if, we're, if we've got the funding up and running for the last year you can create them in july um, with the new program option it's a different program option than when you're using this gear so they can be running they can exist in the system concurrently um, so you, you create these ahead of time um, on the site page if you're creating a new class you can click new or advanced users you can look at the previous year's class and hit copy and just change a couple pieces of information and change the name slightly and resave it so you don't actually have to put everything in you can clone it <laughs> it's just a little bit advanced because you've got to know the new program option um, and put the new year in that's really all that's changing so once people get used to this, I think that's how we'll do it. So you complete the new class by putting in a name. Uh, make sure you have the right program option. Um, make sure you're using the new one and not last year's, or you won't be able to put children in for this year. Now you see the room there again, if you're copying it, it's already there. You don't have to replace that. So you don't need a new room every year, just a class. Now schedule is the same way. Um, you can use the same one as last year. You can use the same schedule for every class at your site. I don't recommend this. I did the first year and I told people to do this and they did and I was wrong. Um, so I would prefer a new schedule for every room. And the reason for that is that that's how you shut down a class, right? So if the room is closed because you're closed for the holidays, then it's actually fine to have one schedule for the whole site because you can close the whole site. Um, and then no one counts as present or absent. Uh, but if you have a class that's closed for some period of time because say a kid was exposed to COVID, so the other classes are open, you want to have their own schedule because the schedule is where you will go in. And I'll show you this in a minute. Um, you, you will go in to close the class. Uh, so <clears throat> that's what I recommend is a separate schedule for each room. Okay, so once you put the classes in, you can add um, teachers and students to the class. So you go to the menu at the upper right hand side of the page up in the corner there and you click on that little down arrow to reveal the hidden menu and then you pick um, add, add staff to class. So I can show you that, but that is a video that is already in the knowledge base. And I looked at this today and I saw that there had only ever been four views of this. Now I can hear and it's five and three of those are me. So I know no one has watched this video. Um, I mean, possibly two of you. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna show you. These are kind of the things that are available in the knowledge base. So there we go.
Okay. So as you may have guessed, now if you're going to add a student to the class, um, it's going to be the same way. You're going to go to the upper left hand corner of the class page and you're going to click on add students. So is he really going to do this? Yes, he is. So this again is the knowledge base. So I'm looking for uh, within the knowledge base, it's CFD cares for delegate agencies. Um, and this section is going to be found under staff management. I'm going to open up. I'm looking at your videos. Oh, look, here's how to add a child to class. More people have watched this video, but not that many. Okay, so. Okay, so that's pretty clear. <laughs> okay, so once children are enrolled in a class, you need to begin to document attendance. We really need this now. We've been trying to gather this information through a variety of different spreadsheets and so on because we need to be able to report on attendance. As soon as everybody starts taking attendance in the system, we can stop with all that but obviously in order to take attendance you need to get the kids enrolled and you need to get them funded because when we talk about attendance we're talking about attendance for for, for prevention initiative we're talking about attention attendance for head start so we have to know how they're funded to get the reporting that we need from in there but once we have that we can we can export this report and not bother you to fill those things out anymore so when you go to classes and this is just a reminder that when you first look in the system at any point you're only going to see uh recently viewed whatever it is classes households children sites funding programs it always defaults to this view so at the beginning of a new year if someone else has put the classes in when you go to this page, you will see recently viewed, which is all going to be last year's classes. Just don't worry about that. Just go change um, the recently viewed menu to all, and you can see the complete list. So we need to take attendance every day. We really like to have it in the morning. Um, so you go to the page that's always going to show you today's date and give you the option to click present or absent and to put the meal count in um, for today. Now you can backdate attendance. You can go to that attendance date line and just filter for the past. Um, 
What I will warn you about is that if you are in putting kids in classes now, but you're setting the enrollment date back to an earlier date, on the day that you enroll them, if you now look in the system and, and filter for yesterday, you're not going to see the children there and won't be able to take attendance for them yet. Um, overnight, the system will rerun and it will add them to the attendance list for previous days. And so the day after you enroll a child in a class, you can take attendance for them in the past. But it's best to do this in real time so you don't have to wait like that. Meal plan is necessary. We have to report on the number of meals served every month to our governing bodies. We can't do this accurately if we're not getting those numbers from you. So please put them in so that we can total them up and prepare a report. Again, we'd like to have initial attendance in by 10 a.m. every day. The reason for that is if there are unexcused, unexcused absences, by which I mean no call, no show. If you were expecting Johnny to show up and he's not there, uh, you should do a safety follow up with the family. Uh, so 10 o'clock is the time by which we have said, if you haven't seen him and we're expecting to see him, it's now time to call mom. So how do we know that they weren't there? if the tennis wasn't in. So please put them in uh, every day. Now, the other thing is, if, as I mentioned before, the class is not open on a particular day, you can and should close it so that it doesn't impact attendance by showing people either it's absent or having a huge number of kids in the not taken category. We actually get reports with three numbers. There's attendance not taken, and then there's present, and then there's absent. So I can we can look in there and see how many of kids have not had attendance taken, and boy, it's at least a third all the time. So please start doing that. <laughs> okay, so this includes holidays, as I said, scheduled breaks, but also if the class is closed unexpectedly, if there's a snow day, if one class is closed because of COVID exposure, one thing that we've had in recent years is we've had either cold weather and there was no heat or hot weather and there was no air conditioning. And so a site had to be closed until that could be fixed. So in all of those cases, you would go to the schedule and create a schedule exception. All that is, is you put a date in there and say that this class was closed on this day. So on the class page, you would scroll down until you see the schedule name. If you click on that, it'll take you into the schedule page. There will be, yes, a related list. And we'll say schedule exception. So you put new and then add the date that's closed. Here I've got last year's Thanksgiving date in here. Why was it closed? Um, and then you save it. And now there will not be an attendance form generated for that day. Okay. The next thing is when children leave, we need you to drop them. Um, there are multiple elements of that, unfortunately. So you need to end them in order. You need to end the class relations. So you put an end date for when they're in the class, but you're not done when that happens. You need to end the funding program enrollment if they're no longer funded. I mean, if they're moving from one class to another, then that's all you have to do here. But if they're dropping from the program, then you would also end, say, their PFA enrollment. Uh, we need that information because often when a child drops from one center, they show up a few days later at another one, and we can't have the overlap. So we, we need them to be dropped from funding and then dropped from the program enrollment. And you're going to do it in that order, because if you drop them from the program enrollment first, you can't edit the, the class relation <laughs> because it will give you an error that says there's no there's no corresponding active program enrollment. So you can't do anything with this. So th they need to leave the class before they leave the site, basically. 
Uh, now, if you're ending an enrollment because it's erroneous, they didn't show up this year, but they're still on the list, there's a two-step process. The first is that you edit their program enrollment and you give them the end date as the same as the start date and then you save it and you edit it again and click invalid enrollment but make sure you've done everything you need to do with the file before you click invalid enrollment because after you click that and save it you won't have access to this file anymore so you won't be able to undo it okay now we're moving on to interactions, which I promised to get to before. So what's an interaction? An interaction is a point of contact with children or families that needs to be documented. This can include home visits or parent-teacher conferences or group socializations um, and other similar interactions. So once you've added funding to a child, um, given the start date for that funding, the system is going to automatically create um, interactions for you. So let's say you're enrolling someone in PI home visiting, and they're supposed to have two visits a month for a total of 24 over the next year. So you, you put them in, and once you've added their funding program enrollment, the system is automatically going to create um, for each two week period a blank uh, home visit. <laughs> this is one of the many reasons we need the children to be enrolled in funding. You can't add this information if we don't know which home visiting program they're part of. So this required part of enrollment and yet Many children are still in the system without funding, um, so please fix that um, now, literally now, like today. There's no reason you should go home before doing that tonight because it's really not that difficult. <laughs> but I'll get off that horse for now. So <laughs> interactions are found in their own related list on the child contact record. Or as I mentioned, you can get to the same ones from a case load. But on the record, as you see here, it's created, um, in this case, it's parent-teacher conferences, and it wants, it wants uh, three or four of them. I don't know why it's doing it, but it doesn't matter. The point is that it's generated a start date and an end date. So if you're supposed to have a weekly visit, it's going to give you each week, it'll have a line here. All going all the way through the program here. So when the interaction occurs, you can edit it to add the actual completion date and add notes. Um, <laughs> so once again, you see on the far right hand corner or, or side of this little related list box, you've got that down arrow. Anytime you see a down arrow like that, that's going to be a hidden menu. You would just click on that arrow and hit edit for the for the correct interaction. So the one for the time period that you're adding and that will open up the screen and you will be able to. Um, get in there and, and make the changes. So I'm going to do this again. Because right now I'm covering material that I learned about from the digital hub. So unfortunately the way this was organized was not according to the categories that perhaps we were used to talking about so there isn't a link here that says education a lot of what we're talking about you can find either under human resources management we looked at stuff that was under delegate agency class management um but neither of those are this right now i'm going to go to family support case management another category you see there's 22 videos in here got screening assessments here how to locate and review and edit individual family interaction and again it's been there for five months there's eight views probably five of those are me so i just want everyone to know where these are which is why i'm doing this there's a lot of other good stuff in here 
Obviously, this is not the only way to get at these. You can also, if you're already within the trial file, you can just find the, the box. If you're in your caseload, you can look down and find the box, um, find their their particular um, interaction from there. So, in fact, if you're just looking for a child, the best way that I've found to look for a child is to go to the search bar at the top of the screen and type their name in, and then usually they just come right up. But anyway, we're going to go on with Dave here. Okay, as you see there, before we go on, you can pick multiple participants for an interaction. So if you're adding um, like a group socialization, I believe you can pick everyone who participated in the event and then only, only use one uh, interaction that then is related to everybody. Okay. So the next thing, and we covered this earlier because we really needed this done at the very beginning of the year. Hopefully this is done for everybody at this point. Um, there are different rules for different funding programs. But basically, you need to get the developmental screening done in enough time to make any referrals and follow up on them that are indicated by the screening. So if the kid's been there for six months before they're screened, that's you know, that's not appropriate intervention. 
Um, so hopefully this has been done for everybody, but I don't know that it's been documented, so we'll go over that. So uh, everybody needs to get a developmental screening. It, again, it's a related list on the screen on the uh, child's contact page. So you would scroll down and look for the box that says screenings, assessments, screen a person. I don't know why that's the name, but that's what it is. Um, so again, click new to add a new one. Um, and you can put the completion date, who completed it, what type it is. Um, <laughs> Fill that everything you know as completely as possible. So the outcome field it asks us a couple different ways, but we need to know if it's okay. Rescreen or refer. If you didn't screen someone because they already had an IP, you still should put a record in and put the outcome as IEP IFSP on file. Um, and again, it, there's a variety of tools here. So you, here I'm picking ages and stages. This is how you identify what type of screening it is. Okay, so if a screening indicates that there should be a referral, there should be a referral. So navigate to the referrals on the related list. And this is one that's funny because as a citywide user, I don't actually have all of the options that you do because I have a different view and I can't add one. <laughs> so I don't have a new button where that blank space is, though, when you are logged in, you should have a new button. So. Here's an example of one. Um, so this is a referral to get an IFSP for someone because of their screening score. You put the household in here, uh, the child's name, the time period, the site that you're at, all, all of that basic information here. And then where you refer it should be one of the CFCs for birth to three kids in this case. And then if it's referred, but it doesn't happen, there is a menu of delay reasons, and we need to know why. Uh, reason for delay is, again, it's on one of the forms that we have to prepare for uh, ISBE. And uh, to some extent, it's also captured for Head Start kids on the PIR. So everybody, if they're supposed to get uh, evaluated but aren't, we need to know why and also when. Okay, so then if you notice here, this is the details tab. There are two tabs in the referral um, object. So here we have the related tab here. They use that word too often, so it's confusing. But in the related tab here, you can you can attach the referral to other things that are in the system. Uh, you can attach it here to the disability. If they are, one is developed, you can attach it to the referral that made it happen. Um, again, if you put the screening assessment in and it indicated a referral, you can attach that screening to um, this referral by just clicking through the screening assessments tab here and linking them. So, and then for a disability record, it is another related list on the child contact sheet. You would, if you need to add a new one, you find that list and select new. Obviously, again, you're seeing a list of them that already exist, and you have that little down arrow at the far right. So if something has changed about an existing IEP, for example, you don't need to put a new record in, you would go in and click on that down arrow and then edit the one that exists. But when you're adding one, it's a big screen, so it goes down more than you can see on one page. We want to know what type of disability, what the eligibility determination date was, the type of service, 
And if you keep scrolling down, you can again link this to the referral and then the start date for services and then the end date. You can put all that information in. Um, <laughs> for anybody who's also doing eligibility, um, for PFA and PI, having an IEP or IFSP makes you automatically eligible for services regardless of income. So if you're trying to get someone through to funding and it's saying requirements are not met, but they have an IEP, go in and put the IEP in and then uh, try to enroll again. And I found that it will let it will let them through if they have an IEP because it overrides the income section. Okay, so there's also uh, when families apply to schoolmate, it asks them to fill out whether they're disabled. Again, if you are doing this on behalf of the family, make sure to check all the boxes and include all this information. Um, but sometimes it hasn't come over completely. So if you look at this particular record that I'm looking at, the parent entered that there was an IEP, because you can see that on the IEP IFSP uh, box on the left-hand side, but on the right-hand side, it's not checking the disabled box. I don't know why. If you see discrepancies like that, start a ticket, and we can follow up and try to fix the information. Because again, this could have um, downstream implications if the information isn't in there correctly. So just keep an eye out for that. Some things you can't change, but when you can't, send them along. Okay. <laughs> so this has been pretty long-winded. Again, not exactly bite-sized. Bite um, so again, I'm just going to cover what we expect going forward. Uh, we're entering a new phase here. All the modules are complete, although they're not necessarily working quite the way that we want them to but we're working on getting data entered and developing reports um that should happen soon but there's no point right now if there's not enough data in to report on we would like to have an easy way to see what's in there and not and i'm hoping to get that to you uh before the holidays but we'll see so we expect everyone to be enrolled we want attendance taken we want health records we want the health history we want the ISBE history for PFA and PI kids. And then, as I tried to point out a couple of times here, we want you to explore the knowledge base. The answers to your questions may, in fact, be in there. So explore that, watch the trainings, and then we send out updates every few weeks. Um, so read them. <laughs> And if you have problems doing any of these things, if we've, I've covered something, we've asked you to do something, you try to do it, and it gives you an error message or you can't get it done, uh, start a ticket right there in ServiceNow. Right, there are a lot of key documents and trainings there. So go in there and look it up. If you have a question, I mean, it's not that great, but there, there is just a search bar and you can go in and search for key terms and everything in there that's related to that will come up. You might be able to uh, find something that will answer your questions that way as well. So that's what I have. I'm looking in the test. I don't see very much. Mm -hmm. I see. The only thing I see people saying is that there was no sound. That may be for the videos. Hmm. Let me investigate that. This video is going to show you how to locate, review, and edit an individual family interaction. The first thing we will do is select contacts. And then from the list view dropdown, we will select children. We will scroll through to find the child that we want to review and or edit the interaction. 
In this case, we will select Jared Smith. And then we will go ahead and scroll down to find the interactions related list on the right side of the screen. On the interactions related list, we can see there are more than six. So we will select view all so we can locate all the various interactions. And we'll be looking for the monthly parent conference meeting for April. So here we find monthly parent conference meeting for 4.1 to 4.30. So we'll select that. And now we can review the information in the main information section, review the information in the status section, in the dates section, and interaction requirements section. The first thing we would want to do if we're going to edit this interaction is we need to go up here to the right drop down and select manage participants. We need to select all the participants that were in the interaction. So since this is a monthly parent conference meeting, we're going to select Jack and Jill Smith, who are the parents of Jared, and they are part of the interaction. So we will then click update. Now we see that uh, the requested changes to the participants for this interaction have been completed. So we can go ahead and click finish. Now we would want to edit the interaction. At minimum, we would want to put the completion date and perhaps some notes. So we're going to click on the edit pencil icon to open the completion date field. And we will select the completion date and we will say that completion date, the interaction happened, the conference happened on May 8th. And in the notes section, we can go ahead and click into the notes section and then we can type in the notes from the conference. If we're satisfied with our entries, we can go ahead and click save. And now that interaction has been saved. So we've added participants to the interaction. We've indicated the completion date and we've added notes. That completes how to locate, review, and edit an individual family interaction. Okay, so I hope that was better. Um, I'm used to doing these things. I've done them for a long time in first WebEx and then Zoom. So getting the bugs worked out with using Teams has been kind of slow for me. But, um, you know, <laughs> getting there. Anyway, we will post this whole presentation on uh, on YouTube soon and send out the slides. Um, so I have one. I'll get I'll get to you individually. I see you out there asking, can I show you how to input the home visit to your caseload? I can, but I don't want to put your um, uh, personally identifiable information for your actual clients on screen. So I will uh, follow up with you later. Oh, here's a good one. What do you do when the categorical eligibility type won't let you select it? It states that you need admin access. <laughs> do we open a ticket? So that's happening um, because certain funding programs only allow uh, certain types of categorical eligibility, right? So child has special needs, is it acceptable um, categorical eligibility for enrolling someone in PI, but not an early head start? So even though you may have different applications with the same information on them for the different funding programs, you have to use a different one because um, disability makes you categorically eligible for PFA and PI, but not for Head Start programs. Um, the problem people are running into is when we set this up, 
uh, you got something wrong. So my reading of the eligibility criteria originally said that, okay, um, Head Start and Early Head Start let you use uh, public assistance as a reason for eligibility, but PFA and PI don't. And I was wrong. I then later read the implementation handbook for preschool for all. And sure enough, if you have uh, proof of uh, categorical eligibility um, through uh, receiving public assistance, whether the SSI or TANF, then you're eligible. Says it right there. The system is stopping you from doing that because we got that wrong when we set up the eligibility criteria. I'm working on getting that fixed. But you can't actually, other than that, you can't actually use some, some of these um, for certain funding sources because they don't make you eligible for those funding sources. Again, the big one is disability. Um, this is a not even a bug, this is an error in the logic. So I am working on I'm trying to get a meeting together next week with the developers for some of these issues. And I'm hoping within the next couple of weeks, you'll stop getting that error. But right now, right now it is. Um, I would just use low income, which anybody can use. The other one that will give you an error is other type of need, which means they're over income. There is only one person in the city who can use that reason, and that is me. So if you're trying to enroll someone who is over income for Head Start or early Head Start, you need to start a ticket and send it to me. I can add the funding as an over income child. Um, and we're doing that because we've had, we've gone back to doing that because we've had the last several years uh agencies that were restricted to having 10 percent over income children but had more um and we're not allowed to do that out of the grant so i need to be able to um make sure that nobody goes over the 10 percent because if you've got 100 kids enrolled you can have 10 of them over income okay and then if you apply for the 11th the answer is no because that would take you over 10%. Um, so what I need to know that. So right now, until I get my uh, eligibility reasons report, which isn't active yet, uh, I need to rely on those PIR spreadsheets to answer those questions to figure out if there's 10%. So I recently told a couple agencies that have asked for over income, but when I looked at their spreadsheet for income reasons, that part still hadn't been completed. Um, so I couldn't tell why kids were eligible. So I said, no, not until those tests filled out. Uh, so just to remind everyone, we wanted that whole first eligibility enrollment tab to be filled out by the end of September, I believe. Maybe it was a date in October, but it was a long time ago. Um, so that should be done now. And so I should be able to look at that and figure out how many over income kids there are <coughs> and who I can approve. Um, but as long as that's blank, you know, uh, I can't help you. <laughs> okay. Looking for anything else. I'm not seeing it again. This is a little long winded. Uh, I wanted to do these in bite sized chunks, but there was just a lot to cover here. I probably could have covered more. Um, because we did so much that was HI this week, I debated whether or not we even need to do one in a couple of weeks, but I, I think I think we probably do um, just because I learned a lot putting this together. And I skimmed over some stuff because of time. So I guess I will be back to do an HR one soon and try to go into as much detail as I can at that point. All right. So until then, uh, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you and all the work that you do. And again, this will all be available online next week. So happy Friday and have a great weekend.